Welcome everybody once again to the Woodbury Community Library. Um, I think everybody knows what we're talking about tonight, but you know, and everybody, I think everybody knows Sean Prentice, local author, uh, woodsman, poet, and I've heard that he's got this amazing uh, reading voice, so I'm excited to hear him read from his book tonight, and then after I'm excited to read as well. <laughs> <laughs> And then, uh, <laughs> and then afterwards we'll have a Q and A session. Shake it out, so, Sean. <laughs> leave it over to Tiny Tim. All right. <laughs> well, well, not only a Q and A, but a, a, a log cake. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. So, I don't know if anyone brought their crosscut saw or chainsaw, but <laughs> we'll be needing that. So, well, first off. Uh, Great seeing all the people I know uh, and the few people I don't know. It's great meeting you. So I'm stoked about that. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to read maybe 30 minutes. And uh, I'm going to start before my life as a trail builder. No, after my life as a trail builder. And then go back to my life uh, as a trail builder. And then return again uh, to pass my life. So... Um, and I think it was 2011, Sarah and I, she wasn't my wife then, uh, but she and I went to an artist residency in Mancus, Colorado at the Aspen Guard Station. I got invited to spend about eight days there. And my project was to revise my first book, Finding Abby. So what I did is I uh, spent every day just working on Finding Abby. And it was all done for the most part. Uh, I think it had plenty of rejections ahead of it. I thought it was done. Everyone else thought it was not done. Um, <laughs> but I would just revise all day. And, uh, and then Sarah would do yoga, play guitar, cook, go for hikes. Um, and then we would go for hikes together when I was done with my work. And she would tell me every single day that I should not just be revising, but I should be generating something new. And... Uh, and revising doesn't seem all that hard, You're just sitting there typing or really mostly reading. Uh, but it tires the brain out, and I was just trying to think what new thing I could try to generate here at the spur of the moment, and I didn't have any ideas. Uh, but then we'd hike all these different trails around the Aspen Guard Station in the Little Plata Mountains. And each one of these trails were trails that I had either hiked or worked on uh, years ago, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13 years ago with my, my crews. And I would tell Sarah all these stories about my time working here. And, uh, and that's when the idea for writing about trail building came. Uh, so here's a poem that starts uh, at the Aspen Guard Station. And it's, uh, again, 10, 12 years uh, after I retired from trail building. It's called Balance Point. I discover a Pulaski, a trail tool I haven't cradled in a dozen years, leaned under the eaves of this Civilian Conservation Corps cabin, convert it into a writing residency. I bear this cutting tool into a nearby meadow of quavering lilies and irises, and I find its balance point. At a dead and down, I raise the axe edge above my head and drive hips and shoulders into the swing, feeling metal sliver air before blade chaws into pine. Fists of bark and sap would leap like spawning sockeye salmon surging upriver. I swing again and again, showering this meadow and trees rays, realizing so many things have changed these years, but some things remain, though hidden, in the fibers of our muscle, remembering and always ready. Uh, so that was about, you know, again, before, or well after being a trail builder. Um, but before I became a trail builder, I was talking to Miles, and uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and then I went out to Colorado. Uh, Curtis and I went to college together at uh, what is now Western Colorado University. And then after that, I went to the Peace Corps. I don't think there's anyone here from Jamaica, um, but if there were, I could talk to them. Uh, and I served in the Peace Corps in Jamaica. And then I came home and I started bumming around um, the US. And by 26, I have lived in two countries and in three states, in an apartment, a cabin, a shed, and a car, running and running. The city where my lover lives is an assemblage of noise, a factory of waste, the racket of rush hour, noosing a knot within my chest. I'm tired of temp work, washing dishes, answering the phone. Santa Fe Community College, how can I take your call? Northwest Youth Corps claims I'll get 150 tent nights. I've never handled a trail tool. I've only backpacked once. I accept the moment the job is offered. And, uh, and I applied for the job with the Northwest Youth Corps. This was uh, like a 
oh gosh, this shirt is old. It's like, <laughs> it's like 25 years old, 30 years old. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I have a couple older ones, but they're dirtier. This was my dress up Northwest Youth Corps shirt. <laughs> Uh, that was not a joke. <laughs> uh, but I applied to the Northwest West Youth Corps uh, with literally like two days of trail experience, and they were both fake. When I was in Jamaica, uh, we took machetes and, and cut open a trail. But I didn't touch the dirt. It was just cutting back brush. Um, and then when I applied, it, it was really a job working with youth, many times at-risk youth. And I had no desire to work with youth at all. I just wanted to be in the woods and alone. So I decided to work for a company where I'd be surrounded by uh, six to 10 youth for weeks on end. Um, and I was really, I had no interest in working with youth. I just wanted to get into the woods. Uh, but I got the job, which kind of shocked me. And uh, I had to get ready. Uh, I didn't know anything about what I was going to do. I'd never lived in the woods. I'd never worked with youth. Uh, but Northwest Youth Corps told me what to buy, so I started buying it. I bought uh, a cheap Eureka tent. I bought some, uh, some dicky uh, work pants. And six days before I repaired to the woods for a five-month hitch, a salesman ha hefts over a pair of 10-inch high West Co. boots with logger tongues and logger heels thick as a burled fist of wood. $200, he says, but these boots will be worth every dime on the trail. I'll earn that cash in three days of building Duffy trails one Pulaski swing at a time or running a hot steel chainsaw till my biceps and triceps scream louder than a two-stroke engine could dream of whining. But my feet, no matter the miles, and there will be hundreds, will never complain. I'll take them, I say, sliding city feet deep into new leather homes. And then it's time to hit the road. Uh, I have a, a girlfriend, Catherine, at the time, so I kiss her goodbye. Uh, she wasn't all that cool. No. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, if you happen to watch Hardwick TV, <laughs> you're great. <laughs> Not as great as my wife, but wonderful. <laughs> I better stop. Moving forward. So then, <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> My wife just left. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, and then, so then I, I get on a plane, fly to Oregon, uh, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm poor, so I have to sleep in the airport uh, overnight on the floor. Luckily, I have that sleeping bag. Get Take a bus down to Eugene, hitch a ride to uh, um, Northwest Youth Corps headquarters, and then we go for a 10-day training into Silver Falls State Park. And these April nights, shivering inside white wall tents, we echo the trail terms Woods Boss teaches us. Angle of repose, rock bar, check dam. These terms become hymns we sing during this week-long coastal mountain training, learning to dig forests into trails. Water bar, hinge, turnpike. We future Northwest Youth Corps leaders, we quiz each other over what these terms mean in the forest of our lives. Hazelhoe, Hago, Cutbank. Woods Boss preaches, so does our trail crew gospel. Woods Boss preaches, so we preach back Pulaski, McLeod, Pickads. During sleep, our hands, they instinctively curl as if still clutching trail tools, and we dream mumble their names. And I'd never used a tool that much and for that long, uh, that many days and that many hours in a row that my hands literally at night would, would bend and they would spasm shut and you'd wake up with your hands just aching and you'd have to peel them open. Um, and we had to learn all these beautiful things, which was awesome. We learned, you know, all the different tools I just mentioned, Pulaski's and McLeod's and Hazel hoe and hog hoes and cross cuts. And, um, but we also got to learn chainsaws, which was probably my favorite. Um, so we'd start with some uh, little tiny piece of dead and down, and we thought we were tough, and we'd cut through it, and we'd be terrified. Uh, and then we'd slowly get bigger and bigger. But we couldn't just run the saws. We had to know how to take them apart and fix them uh, in case they broke in the back country. So we'd come back after a day of work, and, and we'd disassemble them. And each sapped component flywheel, sprocket cover, chain catcher, laid before us leaders in a training, a dissection, directions without a road map, scattered seed from a flower. We studied this orange saw as one studies a new lover, learn how this hard burl of engine misfires unless cared for like a child. 
These parts come alive, chain tensioner, gas oil mixture, carburetor box, hex nut, and clutch cover. They become organs, blood, lungs, joints, mechanical skin. Dogs we purr, awed by sharp biting pivots. Our round files, they pause on the one element that rips apart these fours. The chain, teeth sharpened, glistening. Um, so after 10 days of learning all about trails, or at least as much as you could learn in 10 days, uh, training ends. And we pack up these white wall tents, break down our stove, plunge sleeping bags into stuff sacks, and we van away from backwoods training towards suiting up our own crews and five months of projects, but not today. Today we erupt into town, find an RV park, rent $3.50 showers, step within hot rains until too soon we realize it pipes away this week's history. And you'd, you'd spend just so much time in the woods from now to, gosh, um, October and very, very little time you know, back in society. But when you came out, you'd take those showers and you'd go from like wilds woods person um, to all of a sudden something that kind of resembled someone that could wander the streets of some small Oregon or Washington town. Um, and then after training, we had four days off. Uh, so we did the things that uh, 20 somethings would do. Uh, we did laundry and took showers. <laughs> We'd sleep. Um, maybe drink a glass of water. Um, but then we also think about you know, what we left behind. So at a Mustang gas station stop, I find an empty payphone booth and call across our massive continent to tell Catherine I found a new world, bigger than anything I'd dreamt. Like when you found God, I long to whisper. I long to tell her I love her one final time. We'll call in three weeks, early May, once Lager Boots next kiss concrete. It is night, night at this Mustang gas station. Later night in her city. Tonight I am drunk on summer, on fatigue, on the task at head. My hand strokes the coiled cord as I listen to her phone ringing, unanswered. And this is in the old days, which all but these three young ones remembers. Uh, no cell phones, no email. You called people on the phone, and if they didn't answer, um, you called them back. And for us, it would be a, a week later or two weeks later or three weeks later. Maybe you'd get a letter, but the letters would always drag on because they had to go to Northwest Youth Corps headquarters and find their way to us. So you were really uh, without connection for, for weeks or months at a time. Um, but with, trail, with the uh, training done and our break done, it was time to go back to the Northwest Youth Corps headquarters. And it was an elementary school. Uh, picture a more modern elementary school than Woodbury, but um, it had the same sort of playing field. And uh, this was the Northwest Youth Corps headquarters they took over. I don't know where the, the elementary school moved, but Northwest Youth Corps moved into it. And on the day that you start it, your, your actual job, There'd be 40 16 to 19 year olds hanging out in where the kids play soccer and tag and all that. And the woods boss, my boss, would just look at everyone. And, and his or her job was to build uh, a variety of balanced crews. So they'd look around and be like, all right, all right, you, you know, that should be a pretty strong crew member. That should be a pretty strong crew member. That one too. And that one, they put them on four different crews. And then they'd look around and be like, oh, yeah, Curtis. We had trouble with him last time. We're going to have trouble with him again this time. He can go over here. Oh, yeah, Dee Dee, you're going over there. <laughs> and they'd start breaking up the crews, uh, and then they'd try to get a, a gender divide that worked. It was normally more male than female, but they'd always try to get a, a few female on each crew. And then the woods boss would just point and say, that's your crew. And day one, I drive this new crew of teens south on Oregon's I-5 towards the poison oak infested Cascade Range. Six teens paid hourly slump in the row seats of our shimmering white van. Apathetic faces gaze at blurred furs as we abandon Eugene for spring and summer intense. When we return, it'll be autumn. In the rear view, I scan their faces trying to tease out history. Today, I can only guess. For a first time crew leader, it can't get worse. Strings, a homeless heroin, da heroin dabbler, who plays guitar, Cirrus hooked on pot and breaking into houses to get money to smoke himself away. Red, a shy, red-haired McDonald's assistant manager, one of only two women on our crew, along with Stacy, a meth addict who will be here so few days, we will never know her myths. 
Boone recently out of alcohol rehab, wears wavy black hair and a ponytail, exactly like Shiloh's, except that Shiloh sports a smiley face wound from ear to Adam's apple to ear where someone tried to cut his head off. The seven of us today, strangers, will spend months building trails, returning to primitive. Today, tomorrow, the five months ahead, I will learn this crew the way rock learns erosion incrementally. And all of a sudden you have this crew, and for me, uh, it was kind of a terrifying crew. Uh, we had a lot of addiction issues, a lot of violence issues, um, and, uh, and a lot of really big, huge hearts. I didn't know that at the time. Uh, I was just hoping to survive. Um, <laughs> I was thinking mutiny, um, <laughs> picturing myself tossed out in the backs of, back woods of Oregon. Um, but what we would do with this crew, we were in a 15-passenger uh, white van with a big trailer behind us, and we'd get directions to the, some end of the, of the road. Normally, it was the end of some logging road, maybe a trailhead, maybe not, and you just go further and further back until you reached your, your home for that week. And then the next week or two weeks later, you'd move to a new home and do a new project. So you just travel the West. Uh, but these first weeks, we are embraced by 19,000 acres of Andes site and basalt mountains phoenixing from the Western slope of the Southern Cascades. Up a convolution of logging roads, we drive till we terminate a sign that reads, Boulder Creek Wilderness. Here, we nest. And then that would be your home. And uh, you'd set up your tents, set up your, your cooking gear. Uh, you could go into the back country with backpacks, uh, or you could stay in the front country. But you do a project there. You might do trail building. You might do trail maintenance. You might do hazardous fuel reduction. Um, you might do noxious weed eradication if your boss was angry at you. Um, <laughs> if you were really lucky, you'd build bridges in the back country. Um, and some of the spots were really I mean, you're in the woods or near the woods, so I mean, it's never too bad. Some of the spots were kind of scorched, um, hot, dry, not always beautiful. And, and then some of the spots, many of the spots were just stunning. And, uh, and I'd ask you right now to close your eyes a moment and then open them to that babbling creek. What is its name? Maybe Boulder Creek or Rattlestone or some other name so beautiful you long to hold it in your mouth, run your tongue across the sound, hush its name back into the full moon breeze, let the crease cork it, creek course its way towards the North Umpqua River. This moment I learned life is too big to hold. It is only something to be tasted, a savoring. Uh, and we just were so lucky to be in so many beautiful spots. And I worked on the, I mean, I worked all over. I worked on the peninsula in the North Cascades, uh, at the top of um, Lake Chelan, uh, I worked um, at Mount St. Helens, one of my favorite, in Mesa Verde, in Arches, in Canyonlands, uh, and a ton of other amazing, amazing spots. And we were just in the woods for, for days and weeks and months. Uh, the longest I was ever in the backcountry without coming out was four straight weeks. Um, and the longer I did this work, the more it felt as if there was two completely different worlds. There was this world that we're all in right now, and then there was the world in the backcountry. And the longer you were back there, the less this world existed, the less it, it made sense. Uh, and the longer we were out there, um, the more we grow toward a condensed language. Words disremembered, abandoned from tents and saw packs. What use for the word sink? When might we utter closet or phone or bank account? These words as unneeded as a third thumb, as unneeded as money or credit card. Girlfriend becomes little more than a weekend dream. After four weeks of woods living, I give you TV. I give you movie theater and radio. Do you want more words that these backwood winds stri uh, strip away? Take traffic jam, take fuel pump, take nine to five God, take commuting, take Howard Stern, take pavement, take concrete. Take, we beg of you, microwave and power lines. Take nightly news. We give each and every one away because these industrial words taint our wild new memories. I remember being in the backcountry and I was talking to a crew member. And I was like, there's that, that, that square thing and then it's got the thing over here and you turn it on and water comes out. And, and he goes, sink? I was like, yes, a sink. <laughs> and, uh, and I was just like, I hadn't used a sink in weeks and weeks. Like, why would I remember that word? Um, 
And so these words would just mostly disappear. And I, I remember, um, I, I was actually looking it up today because I was trying to remember the details. I think it's Thurston High School. There was one of the earliest school shootings. And I came out and I opened up the newspaper and it was front page news of the Oregon newspaper. And, uh, and we read all about it. It was on every radio program. And then you go into the woods and it all just disappears. There's no more news. There's no more newspapers. There's no more radio. And it, it just left our world. And then we re-entered and front page of every newspaper was that same story, same news. And it was just such a stark reminder of that divide between here and there, between us in the wilderness and us um, in towns. Um, but being in any one world comes at a cost if you leave the other world. Um, you always give something up. And remember when I told you that this crew had disremembered so many words, how we gave those words, cable TV, desk, VCR, coffee maker, back to society, how we begged you to dispose of them, just broken sound, glass in the mouth. Forget all that. For now, things of two months living in a tent, weeks on spike without shower or shaving, days without changing my hickory shirt or boxers, clothes faded to rags, stained of earth. Everything is conceived from rock and dirt anyway. I need to talk about an aching. Another crew leader, Ethan, and I spent a night in Hood River. Tonight, we are human and in love with our women thousands of miles away. We also need something stronger than iodine-treated water, so we spelunk into a midday bar. But I'm meandering. I find a payphone slide quarter, quarters into its hard belly. Catherine's everything I'm not. She is pulsating lights, dance club, marble lights, burned to the butt, hands of clay. Her voice huddled in a megapolis of subway lines and tunnels. Why is it so easy to talk to you, not her? She fusses across phone lines about kissing lips, not mine. I sever our line and stumble, not yet drunk towards our bar. And this June night, Ethan teaches me the last lessons of drinking to excess, waking in some $40 motel to an alcohol fog. There was once possibility. Come haze morning, no one loves me except the perfect balance of the Pulaski. I have no home except that echoing tent, that sleeping bag that no matter how tightly it sheathes this body, never feels like arms, like thin hips. This exact moment, I commit only to crew. To trails. And uh, yeah, so you know, you just you couldn't stay in touch with that other world. Um, so you just gave up all these things, and, I, and you do it season after season. I worked in the woods from 1996 to something like 2005. Not all the time. Sometimes I would, I went to grad school for three years in there. I would never work in the winters because it was too cold. But you spend months there, and I had so many great friends that I, I love. Uh, like Ethan, who I just read about. Uh, I haven't talked to Ethan uh, in 30 years because, uh, you know, you work in the woods and you just float apart and you meet cool people and they disappear. Um, not only was it hard to keep a girlfriend or, or friends, um, but I would live with a family of, of six to ten youth day after day, week after week, month after month. month. You'd wake up at 4.30 in the morning, um, be eating by 5, uh, be hiking to the job site by, by 5.30, uh, working until 2.30, 3.30, whatever, eight hours, nine hours would be. Then you'd come back, you'd do chores, you'd cook dinner, all of those sort of things. Try to get them to go to sleep on time, then you'd do all your paperwork, and then you'd repeat over and over. Uh, and the crew would wonder why I would get frustrated. And they'd ask why I'm, I'm yelling. I'll tell you why I'm yelling, Strings. It's because you're late every freaking morning, because you left our bastard filed out last night and now it's rust, because you and Boone argue each night about how messy your tent is rather than cleaning it the hell up, because Cirrus burns last night's rice, because I haven't dreamed six hours of sleep in weeks, because my feet are trenched from working under rain and, and in Whiskey Creek, because my thumb is a knob of undoctored pus, because I haven't kissed a girl in 93 days and I haven't seen a girl I could kiss in 26 and Catherine is kissing someone nameless, because my tent sleeps upon a bed of granite so the only thing I can hold at night is rock, because I'm sick of being a leader. I'm desperate for one night at the Trophy Room Bar in Prospect, Oregon, so I can complain about you, all of you. 
Since I cannot tell you any of this, I commiserate only with the Cedars, and they are miserable conversationalists. Uh, and you'd just be with these people day in and day out. And it was often a huge grind. Uh, strings uh, was awesome. He played guitar for us pretty much every single day. One of the worst work ethics I've ever seen. So you'd have to always be on his case. Just, you know, keep swinging that tool, strings. Keep swinging that tool. Um, he always tried to quit. I mean, he tried to quit hundreds of times. Uh, you know, you'd catch kids doing drugs. I once had to fire a kid for doing drugs, and then I had to drive him to the police station, get him out of the van, and he you know, put his hands on the police car and the cops, put handcuffs on him and take him away. So you had all, all these struggles, but you also had like so many joyous times where you're just, you're in the back country and no one is around. So you kind of create the culture so you can be as dorky and as silly as you want and no one can tell you that you're lame. Um, so we'd sing all these songs that we made up and do all these dances and always ask questions like, all right, if you could have one meal anywhere around the world, where would you go? Uh, and we you know, dream of all the different foods we would eat because we would eat really bad foods. Um, and we do all that. Uh, but then it's autumn and the season is almost done. Uh, and I, when I get the chance to look at myself uh, in a mirror, uh, I'm all greasy hair. I've got a big wild beard. I used to have hair and it would stick straight up. Um, and, uh, and it all reminds me when I look at myself that these clothes were once wool of sheep, bowl of cotton, till sewing machines overlocked these fabrics together. These work pants are now aged into holes shined into the knees by the kiss of dirt, colored by rainbow chainsaw oil and the dark cloud of gasoline. This hickory shirt is tailored by rivulets of sweat. These garments wear like fur upon the bull of the woods. Um, yeah, and the clothes are falling apart. Um, my hair was a mess. I was dirty. I was stinky. Uh, the season is ending. Um, and we're, we're toward our last days. And as I wrote this book, I'm going to step out for a sec. As I wrote this book, I tried to write a book that was accessible to trail builders. Um, one of my friends is a poet named Jack Riddle, Riddle and he wrote a, a book called Losing Season, which is one of my favorite books of poetry ever written. And it's all about a high school basketball team that stinks. And it's a, a novel in poems. And I interviewed Jack for a, 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 um, an article. And I said, Jack, are you trying to bring people to poetry with your accessible poems? Because they're super accessible. And he said, no, 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 no. I'm trying to bring poems to people. And I love that idea. We're not saying, come here. We're saying, let me come to you. And, and Jack wanted to bring his poems to people who loved basketball rather than saying, hey, you like sports? Come to me. And these poems were just so easily to un easy to understand and enter, uh, and I just love that idea. So I tried to do that throughout the book, except for with this poem. This poem is um, a poem about Gilgamesh. I don't know if anyone ever read Gilgamesh. It's the oldest recorded book that we know of. So it's the oldest book. It was written on clay tablets, I believe. And it's about Gilgamesh, the king of his city, and then outside is Enkidu, and Enkidu is this kind of wild beast of a, of a, I guess a wild beast. I don't know if he's human or not. Yeah, uh, one translator renders that as nature boy. Nature boy, yes, yes, he's nature boy out there. Um, and and uh, Gilgamesh realizes that Enkidu is his biggest threat, so he sends out Shamhat, who's maybe a sorceress or something like that, to have sex with him with Enkidu, and then by doing that, steals a lot of Enkidu's power and makes him come into the city. So there's this whole dynamic here, and then Enkidu and Gilgamesh team up and they go on these great adventures. Um, but Enkidu is never again nature boy. After months constructing trails, digging society from our bones, this crew has transformed into Enkidu before he loved Shamhat. When he spoke the language of those who ate grass and drank from water holes, at our end, I fear Enkidu's spirits desert us. Each of us soon exiles and as Enkidu was. Too soon we return to the rule of ruining cities. No longer home beside bear and elk. No longer drinking from crystalline creeks. Um, and then we leave the woods and we drive I-5 back towards Eugene, uh, where all this all began. Until we have a long list of lasts and finals. Till we sling no more dirt. Till we birth 
no more trail, till we climb from our van, till we, known for so long only as crew, become you and you and you and me. And then we let them all go, or I guess I let them all go. They go back to their parents and their lives. This is again before Twitter and email and Facebook. So almost all of them have disappeared completely. I would stay in touch with some for, for as long as we could. Uh, but then time goes on, and now we're back in the time of the Aspen Guard Station, and this will be our last poem. And uh, I had left the West, and I'd moved to, to Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I felt without place there. I'm not a city person, and I need mountains or hills. Um, and I, the, the, the biggest thing around me was buildings, uh, and that didn't work for me. Um, the, and the more I'm living there, the more I'm dreaming west, thinking about those mountains. And when it's lonely here in Grand Rapids, and those wildernesses seem so much farther than beyond the 100th meridian, I pace the confines of this house until I end up in my living room closet, flipping through 12-year-old photo albums. I almost dig my fingers into the earthen images of Duffy Peninsula soil or St. Helens ash dirt. Leaning closer toward these photos, I feel wet wind sloughing off. And instead of these closet walls, it's a blanket of Devil's Club. Instead of these hardwood floors, it's towering false cedars. With my fingers on these photos, I realize if I had Pulaski'd this world, there'd be no straight shot highways, no nine to fives, no subdivisions assembly lined into the broken images of Abraham Levitt's and son. I set down these photos and I stumble into a nightfall of mortgaged houses. And I bury my face into this yard's only tree and then low into the dirt's reek. Thanks. I'm going to make a non-related comment. Coffee's ready. Sean, <laughs> <laughs> how old were you when you were doing this? It was 1996, so I'd have been 24, maybe 25. So that's when I started. And then I did it for nine years, so I, I ended probably in my early 30s. And we were talking about, you were talking about, you know, building. Um, and it's, you know, I was getting tired of doing the physical labor that much every day. And, and that young? <laughs> well, you know, most of it was the food. Yeah. It was really tedious food. It was good for six weeks, but then if you did it over and over and over again. And then tedious of not having a stable life. Um, so those two things kind of wore me down. So that's where did the kids come from that you worked with? They, started, they came from the community. So, you know, anywhere in Oregon or Washington or even Northern California, so kids would apply for a summer job or the courts would send them or they'd come from like a, a rehab place. But often, you know, they were looking for some way out kind of as much as I was. And they got paid very little and then they had to pay for their food so it made even less but you know they made some money uh, by the end of the season yeah so sean um you said that you worked everywhere from the cascades to mesa verde which is a big area so were you doing this same activity in the colorado area where around mesa verde and as well in san juan's etc or just Oh, yeah, a lot of the same style of work. I worked for two different organizations. I worked for the Northwest Youth Corps, and then I moved and worked uh, with the Southwest Conservation Corps, and then I moved back to the Northwest Youth Corps. And uh, so we would do, you know, the terrain affected things. In, in arches, uh, we hauled a lot of dead trees to build, uh, like cedars and, 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 uh, and such, just build, like, wooden like not fences but just like wooden barriers so yeah, that yeah, tourists <laughs> couldn't cross yeah, yeah. or we'd set giant rock cairns you know so you weren't really digging trails because there's no dirt uh you know and then in mesa verde we were working on backcountry trails that no one gets to go to or um we did another project where we just cut acres and acres of, of land you just run your chainsaw like this for eight hours a day and uh, when we just haul, I mean, slash that big and put it into a dump truck and haul it off. And we found a couple of ruins that no one had ever discovered before. I mean, they were tiny, like, I mean, it was. So you found yourself in places that, as far as you know, modern man hasn't stepped. 
I mean, yeah, especially, yeah, I mean, there was spots where very, very few people ever go. Yeah, which was awesome. Yeah. And what were the trails? Were they hiking trails? Were they access trails for? Normally hiking trails. The, the Mesa Verde trails were not open to the public. I really want to go back and have someone just drop me off so I can just head back down. There's some amazing ruins that are just back there that are as pristine as what you see up front, but there's no one around, and it's all Ruin, what kind of... An, uh, ancestral Puebloan ruins. Okay. So um, Mesa Verde is just like, and yeah, and it's just, and yeah, just stunning. But then, you know, we'd also do, if a fire had come through an area, they might ask us to just pull out a uh, thistle, and you just dig up the thistle, and dig up the thistle, and you do that eight hours a day, or they'd ask you to go into a, a a timber stand and just saw off branches up to 15 feet high on every single tree in this block. So you just spend all day uh, sawing branches off for five days. Uh, and unfortunately, once I sawed off a, a branch that had poison oak on it oh, and went oh, right yeah. down my shirt. So I got poison oak all on my chest. It was horrendous. So, yeah. Did, uh, got her in the, yeah. Maybe there's a poem about this in the collection. One of the things that you're compelled to drag in from the outside world is either a clock or a watch or both. Mm -hmm. And yet everything else would seem to militate against our modern measurement and quantification and exploitation of time. That must have been quite a conflict for you. I mean, you've got to get the kids up at some time. You have to get up at some time. But everything else gives you a chance to get away from the six seconds and the minutes and the hours. How, well, how did that work in your head? I don't think there's a poem. There should be a poem about ne that. Next edition. Yeah, next edition. <laughs> <laughs> when I sell my million copies and they, uh, they are screaming for a second edition, I will add that. Uh, yeah, I always had a watch with me. I think I still have the same, I do have the same watch uh, at home. And it was, we, ha we had so much we had to get done in a day that you had to be kind of regimented. It was a, a, a job for them and for us. And for our organization, they got paid based on what we completed. So if we didn't complete the job, the company suffered. The nonprofit suffered. Uh, so we always needed to achieve that. And a lot of times with the heat of the day, you'd want to get to work early. And if you know me, I'm a crazy early morning person. So I'm like, let's get to work early. Let's get done early so we can enjoy the nice part of the day, not be working. So, yeah, it was weird. We were, And then they had to get eight hours of sleep by law. And if they don't, then there's all sorts of, you know, work law issues. So yeah, we were on a tight schedule all the time, which was weird. You know, weekends we could relax more, but it wasn't often just like sitting by the creek, your feet hanging out in the water and enjoying it. Um, but yeah, there was that real contrast. Uh, and then your alarm clock would wake you up at 4.30 in the morning. Um, or better yet, wake them up at 4.30. <laughs> so you were always driving to a base, and that's so you would haul your food with you in whatever vehicle you were, and always going out and then coming back to that base, and you'd take six weeks with you at a time or something? Or? Yeah, so we'd have our van loaded up with uh, enough food for, depending on, on the time, a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and then we'd go to a project, set up a camp, and that would be our base, and then we'd either walk or drive to our project, come home walking or driving and then you know eat our dinner do education fall asleep wake up in that same camp go back to the project sometimes the project was right at the tent sometimes we'd have to walk six miles or, or drive down a road so it, it changed and then every weekend normally but not always you'd meet up with other crews and you'd all hang out and uh, your crew would kind of disperse into a bigger group which was awesome because then they would all just kind of cause trouble with each other. Um, and then you'd get your crew back and you'd go to a new site. And you'd just do this all around the Pacific Northwest or later the desert Southwest. So each week you're in some new home uh, with your same crew. Um, Is there a favorite place from somewhere between the Olympic Peninsula and Mesa Verde? Was there? yeah. <laughs> There's so many beautiful things in between there and, and in those two places. but. Uh, St. Helens to me is a real, real special mountain. I worked on both the blast zone side and, and the more old growth side, the west side, and that is a, is a really stunning mountain. Uh, the North Cascades near, so we had to take a ferry 
um, up Lake Chelan, Lake Chelan, and then they drop us off in a little town of Stahican that has roads and cars, but the roads don't go anywhere. So you just got in a school bus and went like five miles, and then they drop you off, and then you hike into the back country, and you're far, far back. And, uh, near these uh, Agnes Waterfall, I think it was, this big, beautiful 80, 90 foot waterfall. And we're camping right on the side of the uh, Pacific Crest Trail. That was a special spot. Mesa Verde is as beautiful as it gets. Um, those are some, but man, I got lucky. I was in a lot of cool spots. Yeah. So, Sean, yeah, that was powerful and beautiful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I have two questions for you. What was your favorite task or project? And the second question is, what would you do, you and the crew, the kids do, on a day when there was rain or inclement weather, when you confined to the tent or the campsite? Yeah, uh, my, my favorite thing to do is build new trails. So normally you're maintaining trails, which is awesome, but it's probably like fixing a car or something, you know, like. You're taking something that's broken and you're putting it back together, which is great. But then when you get tasked with building a trail, they're just like, all right, you're going to start here and you're going to go to that microwave and uh, have fun. And then you've got to figure out how it goes, where it goes. No one's telling you what it has to do. And then you get to just start looking and be like, all right, how, if I was a walker, if I was on a horse, if I was on a bike, would I want to get there? What am I going to have to get around? What am I have to have to get over? What do I need to, to get away from? So that was part of it. And the other part, when you're building new trails, you build it differently than you maintain a trail. When you maintain a trail, I have Didi doing a project over here and Miles doing a project over there. And then I'll have you two working over here. And then I'm, I'm running up and down, making sure that everything's happening. And that's great, but it's a lot of spread out crew. Uh, but then when you're building a trail, the way it works is we all come together and there's someone at the front of the line and someone at the end of the line. And the front of the line, all you do is you just do what's called putting in top line. And you just take a, normally a hog hoe and you are just designed with drawing a line from here to that microwave. And it, wherever it curves, however it goes, and your, your line has got to be beautiful because that's going to set up everything else. And then the next person just does one thing and all they do is start digging into that top line and getting rid of the, the, the organic matter, the grasses, the duff. But they don't do much more than that. They're just like really starting to throw things off. And then the next person does more or less that job and the next two or three people then start digging into the dirt. And then the next two or three people start moving that dirt. And then the final person is just smoothing out that dirt. And the final person, uh, let's say it's Dee Dee, her job is to just push everyone. And anytime she gets close to the person in front, she just yells bump. And the whole crew just stands up and moves three feet down the trail and keeps going. And then her job is just yell bump, bump. And we just keep moving and moving. And it's this big giant like really slow sprint. <laughs> Everyone's leaning over and you just hear bump, you're like, oh, and you just move and just keep going. And then at the end of the day, you turn around and you walk back on your trail. And if you're at the front, all you did was literally just go like this all day and just making sure that you cut a, a nice straight line or a beautiful line. And, uh, and if you're Dee Dee, you've seen everything, but you haven't really looked at it. And then you just walk back and it's this beautiful trail. And you spent all days together as, as a unit, as a machine, just working together. And no one did anything more important than the other. And no one did anything all that important, but all of us created a beautiful trail. So that was my favorite. We also built some really big bridges, you know, bigger than this room. And we'd have to cut down old growth trees with cross cuts. I mean, huge trees. And then we had uh, 24 people. We would move these trees um, six inches at a time. Uh, so that was just cool. And then setting them up and, you know, building, I mean, just really dynamic, cool bridges. So that was probably another really cool thing. Uh, and this project would start in April and go to October. And uh, my first time I worked in spring, it rained every day or snowed every day for 30 straight days. Um, and we're living in tents. And you have maybe one pair of clothes, maybe a second pair of clothes. So every day, um, you're soaking wet. And the only way to start a fire is with chainsaw gasoline. And uh, you know, I'd love to like do some sort of cool, you know, <laughs> spark and light it, but like everything was soaking wet. Like I mean 
it's been under snow, it's been under rain, it's been under more snow. So you just pour as much gasoline on it as you could and just light it, boom, and just, you know, just keep pouring the gasoline until something dry top and you just hover around it freezing and then you'd go to bed and you'd freeze. And I remember my crew members, <laughs> they would wear every single piece of clothes they had and then they'd wear their rain gear and then they'd crawl into their sleeping bags and they were like, you know, like this much bigger, you know, with clothes on and they just freeze the night and I would freeze. Um, and then I remember one day specifically, we were somewhere in Oregon, I can't remember where, and uh, it was so cold that we ran through the entire day because we were all on the edge of hypothermia. And if we slowed down, we were just all shivering. We, we had to skip lunch because we couldn't stop because it was dangerously cold. Um, and then another day, I remember uh, one of the first days when we got that crew I was talking about, we went to the end of a logging road and we got a rainstorm and some rain snuck into the edges of the tent and uh, the females on the crew uh, came out and they're like, Sean, we're flooding, we're flooding. And I, I go into their tent and I look, I'm like, everything's fine. You know, there's a little bit of wetness here, just move in, everything's fine. And then we dug a little trench and I mean, it was not an issue. Uh, and then a couple of weeks later, maybe four weeks later, we were down near the, the Oregon coast and we set up the tent and or, or all the various tents. And uh, the next morning I was talking to those same females. I was like, so how'd you sleep last night? They're like, good, we got a little wet. I was like, well, let me see how wet. And they had like this much rain <laughs> in their tent. Like they were sleeping in water. And I was like, last time you yell about it flooding and there was no water. And this time you just sleep through it. And they had just gotten so tough uh, that, that, you know, they just they were like, ah. We're soaking wet, big deal. Um, so that's what we would do. We'd get really, really wet, build artificial fires, uh, and freeze, freeze, freeze. Yeah. So, Laura? Thinking about animal encounters and any good story, I'm sure you have a million good stories about that, but anything dangerous, anything beautiful? The most dangerous things by far were either our tools or my crew members. Uh, I had, um, those animals. I, I had those animals. I had one crew member who came to me from the courts, he was, um, he was an accessory to murder. They had tossed someone off a bridge. Um, and uh, and he, he obviously had a ton of baggage. And, um, and this is not what you're asking at all. But uh, <laughs> this is a good story, yeah. he had a, an ax in his hand and he just threatened me with it. And I was like, all right, you know, like, either we have a problem for the rest of the, of the, the session or we have an axe fight uh, <laughs> or we or we end it right now and i just looked at him i was like all right let's go you want to do it let's go and he backed down and then he started crying and then you know we rebuilt everything and he became decent after that uh and we had no more problems with him um we had uh, often 10 of us 12 of us uh so uh, yeah, animals didn't want anything to do with us. They'd be like, I don't know who those partiers are, but don't go over there. Um, but the one beautiful moment with animals that I remember was we were at St. Helens and it was dawn and we were driving across the burn zone and someone spotted an, uh, a Roosevelt elk way up above us. So we stopped. And I think we even got out of the van, which we never did. We we're just hanging out on this deserted road and this elk starts coming down and then you see a couple more elk. And then you just see a big giant dust cloud. And the whole, this whole herd of elk, probably 50, 60, 70 elk just ran right in front of us, crossed the road and just kept going. And that was really stunning, uh, especially because you can only see some of them until they hit the road. And then they just go right back into the dust. Um, but yeah, not many, not many wild animals. No, no, they thought we were crazy and loud. Yeah. I know how reluctant I have been in the decades of, long, of my fairly long life to put up with discipline, even when it's probably a matter of survival. I'm wondering again, and there might be a poem, or maybe you could just reflect on this. You're in an environment out there where, you're, where all sorts of new perceptions and possibilities are coming open to your mind, new definitions of freedom, and yet the nature of your work is so regimented that it makes the United States Armed Forces or a typical American factory 
it seemed like Fred Rogers neighborhood. I, I'm curious how you how you could sort out the, the the call of freedom and the absolute lockstep nature of what you did. Well, strangely, that that discipline led to freedom. And what I mean by that is that first crew I had and many others, I mean, there was just a ton of problems with, with me and with the youth. And a lot of that problem came from freedom. These youth had no guidance or they had terrible guidance from their parents. So they were doing anything they wanted all the time. And, and I could have let them keep doing that, but then we, we couldn't have accomplished anything. I, I wouldn't have trusted them. We wouldn't have been a, a community. So by having really strict discipline, especially early on, once they understood what was expected of them, uh, for a lot of them, it was the first time in their lives that they knew how to be good and they knew what would be considered inappropriate. And once they figured that out, then they could start aiming towards good. And, and once they did that more and more, then the leash got longer and longer. And then I'd be like, all right, got her. All right, I need you and Janet to take the cross cut and go two miles down the trail and cut that tree. And I'll see you by lunch. And uh, you two go and you do that. And you do you know, whatever fun things you do and then you come back. But I know I can trust you. And I know if you do anything that you're not supposed to, it's probably not too bad. Um, but the more they understood what was expected and how they should behave, the more you could just give them free reign uh, cause you know, and really by the end of many sessions, I was doing very little and they were doing almost everything in terms of, of directing the crews and guiding the crews. And my job was just to like, make sure that these future leaders were doing a great job. Um, so it was this weird dynamic, but I'm a firm believer. If you know how to succeed, if you know what, if you know what is expected of you, it's a lot easier to succeed than just having no rules because uh, it's a community. You know, like, you know, we don't want people going 70 miles an hour through Woodbury. We want them going 35. And if everyone goes th through 35, then kids can cross the road if they have to. So, um, so that for me was the dynamic. But it was, we were really, really, really strict um, many times. But then again, once they got good, they could chill out and I could chill out. So, Becky? I wonder about any... Um, was there any particular transformation you saw in someone that had a you know big meaning to you, like Axe Boy, you know, <laughs> kind of making that turn? Was there anything in particular that stood out to you? With yeah, some of them? hundreds of them. I mean, there's just so many I could think of. I'm thinking of Jenny Craig, uh, one of my favorite crew members ever. She, the first day I met her. She had as much makeup on as a human could wear and had as much makeup in a bag as a human could bring. And the first thing she said to me, and I'll always remember this, she just looked at me and said, what's up, homie? <laughs> and I just said, you can call me Sean or you can call me sir. <laughs> uh, and then she was trying to pack all of her makeup into the back country. And I was like, oh, here, let me see that. And I zipped it all up. I was like, this is all going to stay here because we can't bring it with us. And, uh, and we had a, a guy named Bob on our crew. And Bob was the biggest guy by far. He was probably 6'2", you know, 220, 240. And Jenny would just be like, Bob, can you do that? Bob, can you do that? And, and Bob could lift big things. He couldn't, he was not a great worker, but he could lift big things. He was like, Jenny, no, you do it. This is, that's your job, not Bob's job. Bob's got this job. And, uh, and then she stayed with me for a spring, a summer, and a fall. So, and she just kept coming back. And, uh, and I remember this moment, we were driving down some fire road in Colorado and a pretty substantial tree, like picture from here to the wall was uh, right next to the road. And we were, we were building a fire break and she saw the tree, she's like, stop. And she hopped out and she just grabbed this big tree and just moves it all by herself. And earlier she would have asked Bob and now she didn't even think about asking Bob. She just did it all on her own. Uh, but there's, I mean, so many different ones, where, whether it was little ones or, or, or big moments. Um, some of the, my favorite people I've ever known in my life uh, were here. And I wish I could bring them back and we could all sit together around a fire again. Well, you're so lucky that Sarah gave you a kick in the butt to write that. And the, and <laughs> yeah. the setting at the time was a prompt, probably. 
So how how quickly or easily did it go once you got started the book, the writing? Real quick and easy in the sense that uh, I have a, an entire other book of trail poems that <laughs> didn't work. I was like, oh, no, that's not actually what I'm doing. So I wrote probably 40 or 50 poems that kind of went the wrong way. And then I sort of went this way. And then my friend's like, well, you either got to do that or that. So then I had to change it again. So I started in 2011. I published it. Perfect timing, right when the pandemic began, a month before the pandemic. Um, so that, you know, nine years. Shit, more revising. <laughs> <laughs> lots of revising, lots of failures. Good one, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> but the only fun part about the, the publishing process was I sent it to one publisher and they wanted it and they published it. So wow. that part was real, real, real <clears throat> easy, which is very unusual. So I got lucky there. Mm. Yeah. Irna? The book is filled with many sensory perception you smell you hear you, it's like you're there in the woods and I, we don't particularly do any tools like that i'm like that girl you do it you know? <laughs> <laughs> but i i do some and i do enjoy the wood and the smell so it was like being there so for writing purposes you must have been in the very immersed in the experience because you're writing in retrospect but yet the poems come very fresh, like you're right there at the moment. So what was the, did you have to go back to any trails? What, what did you do? Or you just have a well, great memory? <laughs> I have a terrible memory. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually someone else's trail experience. I couldn't remember my own. <laughs> no, I, I don't have a great memory, but I, I could remember I mean, there were seminal moments in my life. It's when I became an adult for the most part. Um, and I just remember those landscapes pretty darn well. I mean, they're beautiful. Uh, but I did a ton of research. You know, I'd look into, you know, look at maps, look at um, plant and tree identification, stuff like that to jog things loose. But a lot of it was just, it was just living in the memory and, and just keep trying to get the reader closer and closer to those sights and smells and touches, except for the smell of our bodies, which were pretty horrendous. Uh, our van was just disgusting. Um, so those things I tried to not get too close to. I should have turned this into a scratch and sniff book. <laughs> did, did you know how to build bridges and things like that? Or was there somebody doing designs or you were trial and error? Or how did that? Uh, so they would send us in with what's called specs. And it'd be like two pages of information. Uh, so not a lot. And then you'd have to kind of think it through. Um, I built one bridge. And uh, we were somewhere in eastern Washington. And we had this little hanging level. So it's a level this big. It's not a big, long level. And uh, what's that? A line level? A line level, yeah. So we put a, a string from one side to the other, hang the level, and that's where you wanted it to be. No, not, well, not only this, but it was broken, and we didn't know it because we only had <laughs> we had one level. And you'd, you'd, you'd hang it on your line, and you'd be like, all right, we're good. And then you'd take your line down, and then you'd hang your line back up. But if you reversed it, you'd be oh. off this way one time, and then you'd be off this way. So what we did is we kept building what we didn't know was broken. So, so our, line, we, our line would be here. We'd be like, oh, I thought we were level. OK, take this side down. So we'd dig it. And then you'd do all your work. And then you'd check it again. And you'd be like, oh, I guess, uh, I guess we didn't get it. And, and we just dug way too deep. <laughs> and if you find that bridge and you ride it on a motorcycle, which is what you're supposed to do, you're going to go like, who built this trail? <laughs> and man, it was such a disaster. And the guy came back. He's like, huh. It wasn't supposed to be that low. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 it was not. <laughs> so, uh, so sometimes you fail. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, about your process when you sit down to write a poem, you have how do you how do you assemble your thoughts into what we were hearing tonight? Like a little bit about your process. Normally, I steal from other people. Yeah. Uh, you know, normally, when I'm sitting down, my daughter's on the top of my head. Uh, no, I started with an idea. So like Didi was talking about 
how this book process went. And I started writing it about Shiloh. He's my favorite crew member ever and my most problematic crew member ever by far. And, and then I realized it was not just his story. I wanted to tell everyone's story. So then I just had to keep shifting it. Uh, and it's maybe the same way I, I do carpentry, which is uh, a lot accidentally, a lot uh, with big, huge gaping holes. And then hopefully <coughs> by the end, I've covered up all the mistakes so no one can see how terrible I am at it. But it's just like, I get an idea and I'm like, how do I write to that idea? And then I don't. And then I'm like, okay, so this is what I have. How do I turn this into something? And then I turn it into something. And then I'm looking at it, I'm like, well, how do I now make it maybe more poetic or more narrative or, or whatever I then want? Or how do I make it look different? And I keep playing until it's somewhere uh, where it's doing some job that I want it to do, not probably what it started out as. Um, this book started out very differently and very few poems ever look like what I imagine them in my head. Um, but I, I love that part. How do you know when you're done? When uh, like, University of New Mexico, like, with, with, how do you know? Like, okay, that's good. That's where I want it to be. Uh, it's never done, but for me, it's when I'm, when I enjoy reading it, and like I can't figure out the next move. And Sarah reads everything important to mine that uh, I send out, and so when I'm done, when I, I get stuck, I'm just like, I like it. I think this is good. Then I give it to her, and she's like, No, it's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> and then. <laughs> She's laughing right now. She's not laughing when she's telling me that. She's like, no, this all stinks. <laughs> um, and then I'm like, all right, all right. And uh, I get a little pissy, uh, but she's always right. And then I just, you know, just, I don't think, you know, like I don't, she'll tell me what she doesn't like. I don't ask questions. I don't have a conversation. I just sit, sit and think about it. I'm like, okay, all right, I see that problem there. Now, how do I fix it? And then I try to figure out some way to fix it. And hopefully don't break something else, give it back to Sarah or another reader. And then, you know, is that problem still there? You know, and I read through this, I, I, I've revised this poem as I was, or these poems as I was reading it to you. There's lines I just dislike, and uh, I, I don't know how they got in there. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. When did you write it? It started in 2011, finished it in 2019. So, eight years plus than a year of editing, publishing. So. Oh yeah, so there's going to be stuff you wrote a while ago and you say, why well, did I write that? But even everything I wrote in 2011, I revised in 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and then I look at it and I'm like, how did I not revise this more? I mean, I probably have 60 drafts of this book. So, wow. yeah. yeah. Sure, I'm curious, you said you started off with some trail poems that were going in a different direction and, and you discovered that these poems were better. Maybe your friend helped you discover that. In which direction were you headed with the other poems, the ones that didn't, weren't as successful as these? So I wrote an essay about a, a crew member named Shiloh. And Shiloh and I spent years working together. He started out as a crew member. He's the one that someone tried to cut his head off. So I think, if I'm remembering this, Shiloh shot a guy. And then the guy tried to cut off Shiloh's head. And then I got Shiloh. And Shiloh was from the Warm Springs Reservation of uh, Oregon. And he was just the quietest human you'll ever meet. Uh, also, maybe the most intense and also maybe the strongest. He was probably my size and he was just, no one could outwork Shiloh. We, you know, as leaders, we, you know, believed that we could outwork anyone, and we could for the most part, but Shiloh was the one crew member who was just stronger than me physically uh, and, and stamina-wise. Um, but then we'd have these little breaks, those four days or, or six days between sessions, and he would go back home, and uh, he was a very different human there. And there'd be you know, addiction issues and, and violence issues, and then he'd come back. So I was telling the story of of him and me, someone who, you know, became like, is like a brother to me, um, but also someone who has probably done lots and lots and lots of terrible things. So it's, and he did some of those terrible things in the middle of working with me, and I got kind of like wrapped up in the ethics of it. Um, and then he became a leader for us and, and both 
both of our lives in the youth corps kind of imploded at that time. Um, so it was, it was going to be the, kind of the story of that. Um, but then I wanted to tell the story of the, the others as well. And, you know, that whole book is sitting on my computer. It's really lame. It doesn't work very well. But, you know, maybe at some point I'll go back. But that's what it was about. It was about Shiloh, something I love still to this day. And I, I'm getting weird Facebook messages from people who don't like Shiloh. And they're telling me to tell him things. Um, and I'm just blocking them. I'm like, I don't want to be in that world. Um, so it's a dark, dark, dark world. So, yeah. Did you journal at all when you were out there? Yeah. Like, I think at first you probably didn't. But then after you went to school or back to school, you started journaling more? Journal even before. That's how I got into writing. My mom told me to keep a journal. So from 17 or 18 on, I kept a journal uh, every day, including most days in the woods. So if you come back to my house, I'll take you into my attic and I'll show you 40 really bad journals. Um, but yeah, I've got all those days all written down. Yeah, and that, I never went back to them when I was writing. I just, I stayed with my memory. I thought about it, but I never did. I don't know why, but I, I made a conscious decision not to go back to them. I think because the writing is horrendous. Um, so I'd just be really disappointed with myself. So. The edit, editing your journals. Oh my, I, I don't have, there's not enough days. There's not enough editors. Oh man. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.